Oh, I have a little bit of my soul is in each one of these videos. If you ever want to truly kill me, you have to kill every single SD card that's ever existed. Howdy, y'all. You grab your hats and saddle on up now, because we're fixing to take a ride through the wild and untamed west. But hold on to your britches now, because this here video ain't just any old history lesson. We're going to rustle up the top 10 most unusual traditions of the wild west that you ain't never heard before. So you sit on tight now and get ready to be shocked, partner. Some folk call me Taylor the Kid, and let's dive on in. Yee-haw! Is he going to do this voice throughout the entire video? Only one way to find out. You're going to have to watch to the end of the credits. Yes, you will. Number 10, dead bodies for entertainment. Now, life sure wasn't easy on the frontier. If the dysentery didn't get you, there was always the chance you'd end up staring down the wrong barrel and find yourself in a hastily dug grave. Or, if you were real unlucky, your dead body got stuffed and carried around the country as a sideshow attraction to get folk to spend a nickel to gawk at you. Wasn't too uncommon for sheriffs to pose dead bodies of outlaws like fishing trophies for photos. Imagine that on Wild West Tinder. Elmer McCurdy was one of the last famed outlaws who after a failed train heist found himself buying the farm at the hands of lawmen after a $46 take. McCurdy's body was taken from coroners by someone who claimed to be a friend but really, all they did was sell them across the country to circuses, carnivals, as the body of an outlaw that you could come pay a nickel to see. Eventually, McCurdy would end up in a Long Beach, California, where a TV show being filmed was using an amusement park as a backdrop. Set designers were moving a prop mummy in the haunted house, only to discover that the prop wasn't too much of a prop at all, but was the stinking corpse of the no-good varmint Elmer McCurdy. He would end up getting himself a proper burial after 66 years. Hey, you think your job's hard? Feller was working 66 years after dying. It's a living or a dying. Number nine, cowboy shows. Is there anything more iconic than the cowboy? The symbol of American freedom, manliness, and all things that made the West. Rough, rugged men with thick calluses from hard days work in the field, not sitting around playing pretend, except when cowboys would play pretend on stage for sold out audiences. Now there weren't too much to do out in the Old West. TikTok was just what you heard if you listened to a clock. So one way folks on the frontier really enjoyed passing the time was watching a cowboy show, where the slingers of western legend like Buffalo Bill would perform all their best tricks and recreate stagecoach robberies or buffalo hunts for thrilled audiences. Now these weren't particularly uh, uh, well-written shows or well-acted shows. These fellas weren't thespians now. They were men of the road. But imagine this sort of thing now. Imagine going to a show to watch a marine fire off a bunch of rounds and pretend to rob a truck. Be kind of weird, I guess. But that's what you do when no one's invented the internet. You get up to some pretty weird stuff. Number eight, eating garbage. If you imagine the frontier, what kind of food comes to mind? Maybe a hearty bowl of chili? A nice stew cooked rabbit over a fire? Oh, you wish. Frontier folk had to eat whatever they could come by in a fork. As such, some Wild West tastes might not sit right on a modern palate. One Virginian cookbook from 1878 lists a way to prepare squirrel stew. And I ain't even gonna bother including the directions in case you wanted to make that at home, cause just the idea of munching a squirrel makes me want hurl. I suppose when you really come down to it, squirrel ain't that much weirder than a rabbit, but I wouldn't order it off the menu. Now if squirrel stew ain't your cup of tea, maybe cooked calf brain might do it for you. Boiled brains of calves were commonly served alongside bacon and eggs as a breakfast staple. Other frontier favorites included son of a gun stew, which was a hodgepodge mix of all the garbage you wouldn't normally eat. Calf hearts, liver, intestines, tongue in a pot with onion, salt, and pepper. Mmm, my stomach's ringing, that's just like mom used to make. What's that smell? Let's continue on that last point about cooking because I got a humdinger of a fact that'll make that last one seem downright appetizing. If brains and guts didn't turn you off cowboy cooking, let me tell you this. The Great Plains and the Frontier weren't exactly known for being particularly arborous. That's a $5 word that means there weren't a whole heck of a lot of lumber to make into firework. Not too many trees around in the desert. So if folks wanted to get a proper bonfire going, you'd have to get creative and use alternative kindling namely uh, feces, lots and lots of buffalo crap. Now, if you're still watching this video and you ain't clicked out, let me keep explaining. It sounds horrifically disgusting, and I certainly would not recommend you use feces should firewood be available, but by all accounting, prairie chips, as they call them, were plentiful, easy to find, and worked real well as kindling. They were quick and hot and allegedly 
didn't smell half as bad as you think. But I'll take their words for it. I would not be surprised none at all if life on the frontier didn't burn their sense of smell. Living in a mining town was expensive. Now this might surprise you, but working in a mine in a mining town wasn't particularly a good time. It wasn't just awful and hazardous to your health, making your lungs black as midnight on a moonless sky, but it was also affecting your wallet. In fact, living in a mining town was more expensive than it was to live in modern day Silicon Valley. And cowboys don't even have the luxury of Uber Eats. You had to wrestle up all that food yourself. You think inflation's affecting your grocery bill now? During the gold rush, real shucksters would price gouge on everything. If your town was getting hit by that gold rush and prospectors were swarming on in, general stores would raise the price on everything to crazy degrees. For example, a carton of eggs from a flourishing store in California would run you $3 in 1951. Now that don't sound too bad, but adjust that for today's inflation and that carton of eggs comes out to $105 for eggs. That better be the best omelet I ever had. If you knew you had loads of miners in town, you could sell shovels and pickaxes for basically whatever you wanted. You controlled the market. Some stores would sell shovels for $36, which would translate out to about $12 hundred dollars in today's dollars. No wonder everyone was robbing each other on the side of the street. The stores were robbing you blind. I'm doing the voice the whole video, editor. I hope you know. <laughs> the real number five, medicine shows. So after a long day being gouged at the market and eating bacon cooked over buffalo poop, you'd probably want to wind down and take in a show. Now I mentioned before you could catch a cowboy show, but if you were all caught up, maybe you'd want something else. What about a medicine show? Now healthcare wasn't much to shake a stick at back then. As such, it weren't uncommon to have a quack ride on into town and start offering a miracle cure for all that ails. Just a drink of this miracle solution and watch your health improve. You see, troublesome some things like the FDA or advertising laws didn't exist way back when, so you could basically say your product did absolutely whatever and it was fine, and by God, you could put whatever you wanted in it. You've all heard the legend of where Coca-Cola gets its name, and I'll tell you, there's a reason for that. Over the years, the art of the snake oil salesman became a performance on its own, an art form, if you will. Medicine shows would have events like burlesque dancers, dogs and ponies, a pie-eating contest, all to get sales through the roof, and it worked. These doctors would take in hand over fist. Way, way easier making money than robbing a train. You just gotta rob people blindly and tell them that you're helping them. Number four, watching a hanging. Johnny Cash shot a man just to watch him die once. If only he'd known that you could just head on out town square to watch a man die, could have saved himself those Folsom Prison Blues. In fact, I never understood why he was complaining about Folsom Prison. He put himself in there. It wasn't uncommon back then out in the frontier for a sheriff to try and swing folk into a good mood to try and make light of a bad situation. Supposedly it boosted morale around town if you watched an outlaw hanging from a tree. And dark as this is, it was a bit of a practical thing. There weren't nearly enough lawmen to stretch across the frontier, so if someone was causing trouble, oftentimes it was a little easier to string them up and sort all that business out later. Crowds would love this too. It might seem a bit uh, grim to you and me, but this would be a whole family affair. You'd bring everybody out to come hurl insults and throw vegetables at a local horse thief, and it was less like an execution and more like a sport, you know? Good fun for the whole community that brings everybody together. Number three, drinking poison. Poison. There are few western locales or imagery even half as iconic as the saloon. Imagine them doors swinging on open, a cowboy moseying on in looking to find out who killed his paw. The kind of place you could play cards and get yourself a stiff drink. A real, real stiff drink. Because if you drank what they were drinking back then, you'd be in a ditch with your eyes rolled back in the buzzards picking at your ribs. There really were not many laws or regulations way back when when it came to what you could serve, so bartenders got real creative with what they put in their cocktails. Old West drinks had great nicknames like Cactus Poison, Coffin Varnish, Tangle Leg, which all sound mighty appetizing. Or maybe you're fixing for tarantula juice, a drink sold in Sierra Nevada which contained actively toxic poisons and wood grain distilled from turpentine. Mm. Goes down easy with a little bit of a kick. Of course, drinking this wouldn't just have you feeling silly, but it would also give you a sensation that you had things crawling through your skin, muscle spasms, locked jaw, but hey, it's still better than drinking Mountain Dew. Number two, crooks were celebrities. Celebrity worship ain't nothing new to the United States. 
America's always had celebrities. Why today we might be obsessed with troublesome bad boys like Kanye West. Back then their bad boys and celebs were thieves, killers, and all manner of crooks. Legendary outlaws like Billy the Kid inspired fans the way we talk about celebrities now. In Kid's case, someone had published a biography about him not even a month after he was cold in the ground. Outlaws were romanticized like Robin Hoods, stealing from the wealthy and giving to the poor. This perception came from the fact that most outlaws came from pretty humble beginnings and turned to crime as a means of survival. Additionally, the harsh conditions of life on the frontier led to a natural mistrust of authority, which fueled admiration for men like this who stuck it up to the law. You'd read stories about them in the newspaper and books, heck, you'd even get trading cards and notorious crooks with a pack of cigarettes. Of course, lawman got famous too. Wild Bill Hickox was a lawman and then he went on to do all them cowboy shows. Makes a lot of sense if you really think about it. These fellas were larger than life storybook characters, except they lived in your town and you could go and shake their hands and ask them about their adventures. Of course those people would become heroes. And number one, anyone could be sheriff. When you think of the Wild West and a sheriff in particular, you might rustle up the image of a square-jawed, handsome fella in a white hat that protects the people of his town from all kinds of evildoers. Well, maybe for John Wayne and Clint Eastwood, but the truth was, sheriff was hardly the glamorous position the movies make it out to be. The sheriff was basically just a guy. Each state had their own requirements for being sheriff, and none of them really had anything to do with how equipped you were for the job. Now, many towns were rapidly expanding and needed law enforcement, but there were very few formal qualifications for such a thing. As a result, many sheriffs were frequently untrained and inexperienced, lacking any sort of skills necessary to enforce the law. In some cases, sheriffs were appointed based on their political connections, ain't that the truth? Which led to all kinds of corrupt folk taking on the role of sheriff and using that power to benefit themselves. Heck, there weren't even rules about criminal records. You could very likely have a convict as your sheriff. In one infamous case in Bannock, Montana, their town's sheriff was allegedly running a conspiracy gang of stagecoach thieves on the side as a part-time gig from looking after the town. To serve and protect indeed. Whew! Well, wasn't that one humdinger of a list? Thank you so much for watching, my Bumblebee gang. You're sweeter than two punts. I was gonna say some southern nonsense, but my brain was working too fast for my mouth. What a humdinger of a video this has been. Thank you very much, Bumblebee audience. You are as sweet as a peach biscuit. You take it easy now.